I'll get, get started with my talk t today, which is called QMU, Emulate Your Way to Success. Give a quick introduction to myself and what I do with my work. And then we'll go through some basic case studies, information about QMU. So welcome, everybody. Um, hope you won't have a nap after lunch. It's great being back in Japan. Uh, I was here back in 2019. So I'm a senior engineer at a company called CodeFink. We're an open source consultancy based in Manchester, UK. I myself have done a number of contributions to things like QMU, Linux, and a few other open source projects. Uh, I really like QMU. It's been really useful, and we'll show some of that. Uh, Legals-wise, I believe that I've been okay to, to put this out as uh, CC by SA licensed V4. Um, it is not V1.0 because I have done a couple of minor edits from when this was last given. Um, so, so the introduction. So we'll aim to show some things that you can do with QMU. We'll go a little bit into what QMU can do. We won't be going into any deep technical dives because QMU is a very big project. It's not kernel big, but it's certainly big enough that it warrants its own conference, I would say. But hey, we don't have that yet. Um, I won't profess to being a QMU expert. Not all of the work that I'm going to be talking about today is my own. Uh, we have used QMU extensively throughout our company in a number of different projects. So we'll start with a quick introduction. What is QMU? So it's flexible open, uh, open source system virtualizer to emulator. It can basically act as something more like a container to a completely different system running on your own computer. It supports many different architectures. Some of these are very familiar. Some of these are now lost to the history of computing. So for instance, x86, both 32 and 64, RISC-V, 32 and 64, ARM, again, 32 and 64 bit, and a number of other things. Importantly, it does not need any kernel drivers to allow it to work. It can be run, it can be run as a purely user process, it, although there are enhancements that features like KVM can give it, they are not necessary for it to run. I'm very sure the main source is GPL v2. There are some bundled components that are not, but those are mainly extra bits you can use. It runs under most Unix systems, uh, under Apple or Windows. So you can pretty much do the same thing that you can do in your Linux under Windows. And pretty much most major Linux distributions ship QMU as standard. We'll do a quick bit of history. Um, this is not very well researched. Um, the first release tag I could find was 0 0.10 back in 23rd of March, 2003. The current release, and this is current, the V7.10 release may well become V7.2 soon. Um, that I believe there's a release candidate by the time you fin by, by the time I finish this talk, it might have moved on. There's also a V8 starting in development, but that will not be around for a bit. It's got over 2,000 contributors. Um, I'm not going to um, say this is accurate. This is me using Git and some scripts to work out. Some contributors have a few patches to, you know, there's at least one with over 9,000. So I'm not going to do a lot of talk about 
the first way you can run QMU. And this is an API emulation. So if you want to run ARM code on your x86 laptop, this is the way you're going to do it. It allows you to run foreign code under your host system. It translates that code into sort of native format. It also will translate the system call information, signals, that sort of useful stuff to allow a process to run as if it was a standard process on your system. So this is very useful for if you're doing, say, a churu into a foreign system. You can use that as so set up a churu or set up a bin format extension. There's documentation for that, and often your distribution will do that for you. So I don't, I, it's probably not very easy to read this one, but that was just me running a terminal starting in x86 land. I use sshroot to go to a Debian ARM64 that I have on the laptop. Well, my work laptop, I left that in the UK, so I haven't got any examples here. But then I can go in, in the same shell, I'm now a ARM64 system. And this is very useful if you just want to build small binaries, etc. cetera. Um, I'm not going to go too much further into this because most of my talk is going to be more around the system level emulation. So this is where QMU can be used to emulate a complete system. So more like your virtual box or something like that. It emulates everything from a CPU cores, a bus setup, devices. You could even change the memory system emulation. So if you're running on a standard flat laptop, you can make your emulated system run as a non-universal memory architecture. Another useful feature that you may want to use is to change the boot flow of the system. So you might not want to start with a BIOS. This is useful for if you're testing a full boot system. Uh, it can suspend and it can migrate your um, virtual machines. Again, that's something I'm not going to talk about. Um, there's also a huge area where it has a, its own little code generator for speed. Um, again, that is a absolute minefield of stuff and warrants its own talks, having played about with this on something else. Again, TCG may not support all architectures and all use cases. It's there. If it, if it can do it, it will. So, what does QMU as an emulate system emulation provide? Well, pretty much all the standard things you'd expect from a machine. You can have input, display, things like character and serial devices, audio, block, networking. You can even do trusted platform modules if you need to do secret management. Some of these have a single connection option for things like display, you can provide all sorts of different output routes from local display to VNC. Again, you have a, a number of different buses you can emulate from standard memory mapped I.O. through pretty much everything you would expect from a system. QMU will provide a lot of standard configuration options for systems, and as we may see later, you can configure to an extent what devices your emulated system can see. This is not going to be an exhaustive list. It's more of an example. Again, with the devices, there are a number of device models that it provides. Again, there are many of these. A machine model may provide you a standard set of devices that you would expect. So if you're just using a standard x86 PC type emulation, you might find a standard input output PCIe, etc. 
there's an interesting use case for actually emulating PC within PC, and we'll talk about at least one of those later. Caveats for this. Device models, whilst they are good, may not be 100% accurate. Um, you, can extract, you can actually also add your own. And there we will talk a little bit about controlling them later in the, in the talk. Some of this you can do via command line, and hopefully if anybody can read this, um, this was a quick example I ran up a while ago using QMU to emulate an ARCH64 system. So the command line here is for a virtual machine. We don't want any graphics. I'm going to give it two gigabytes of its own memory. I'm going to tell you it has two SMP cores. The rest of the command line is saying, this is the kernel I want. This is an initRD. The arguments I'm going to give to the kernel that I'm running, which is the append. And then what it, I'm going to add is I'm going to start a USB system give it a QMU XHCI emulation so that it has something that the kernel can see as a way of actual device. Give it a drive for that. So the drive I'm going to say is called USB stick. It's a raw file that I've created somewhere. And the final line of this, I can say to the USB storage device model, here's your USB stick. That's what you can do. The device will start up. You'll have an emulated USB stick, which you can use for storage. Um, not going to go for a demo here because time and demos very rarely work properly. So talked a little bit about the whole emulation setup. Usually, there are just a set of standard machine models these will define how your system works. Standard devices, standard boot method, and you, you should get a system running. This generally good enough for quite a lot of stuff. The interesting problems happen when you actually want to build your own machines because that can run into some issues. Quick talk about networking. It provides networking. Uh, usually, this is done via a virtual network device that can either be backed by a real device, so something like a tap or tunnel, or it could emulate a system and just call, use the host's network socket calls to actually make the network connections out. It does usually IPv4, IPv6. You can do some raw Ethernet. CAN, slightly different, but still you can use a virtual CAN socket, connect it to the machine. We've had systems where you can create virtual CAN networks between a number of different QMU hosts running on the same machine to emulate, say, a vehicle with a, a CAN network. Again, there's a lot of... Um, mileage there, you you can read up on exactly how complex you can make systems uh, as a post-talk exercise if you really feel that way. So, boot flow. Your system needs to start somehow. You can go from anything from just giving QMU a blob of code and get it to do, execute it. Um, we've done that for some very interesting testing of bare metal cases for customers. QMU will just give you a basic entry, call the code and get it run. You can also use higher level start systems. So imagine things like on your PC, that would be a BIOS. QMU comes with at least a standard open source BIOS implementation you can use. Or you can give it something else. You can, on ARM, you can use TrustZone. 
which will then call down into another level, which you will need to also have loaded. Open SBI is the risk five similar machine level services block. These codes can then install what they need to do before they call into the a kernel or other binary block. Um, you can do all sorts of boot flow emulations if you like. So you could provide the U-boot initial loader and then allow that to load code from an emulated flash device, which is very useful if you want to test, say, your modifications to U-boot. You can load U-boot main, um, grub, or whatever. It's very flexible. So, if you've got a running QMU, you can control the state of the system via a system called QMP, which is the QMU machine protocol. It's very, very JSON based, and you just have a socket you can connect to either locally or via network interface, which you can use then to control the state of your system. So if you would like to inject or hot plug devices or anything else you've done, there's a Dbus interface that allows you to get at some of these interfaces as well. And if you're just running it on local command line, there is an interface you can use just to break out of your console and then issue very much the same command methods. This is useful if you want to automate some testing. Again, not only can you debug QMU itself, you can also debug into your emulation. QMU has a GDB server that will serve the state of your running emulated system. It also has some of its own internal tracing you can use if you need to, say, do some development work. Um, so for instance, we've done work adding machine models to QMU. Um, unfortunately, legal issues have stopped us uh, actually submitting that debt, which apparently they've been working out while I'm here. So for internal tracing, you can use uh, the, the command line to enable a tracing, so you can say trace M25 star, which will trace all the M2580 flash driver operations. Very useful to see how your, say if you've got a system that isn't booting properly, you can trace what the flash was doing, you can trace maybe what the SPI driver was doing. Um, if you get really desperate, you can trace all the memory operations but you better have a big log file ready for those because it produces a lot of output. So that was a very much just general overview of what QMU can do and how you can use it. Um, so go go through some projects that we've done. So first one, won't go into too much detail, but this was the use case of using an x86 machine within an x86. We needed to do some work on the kernel entry code. Um, we could have done this by setting up some machines, but if you don't know, PCs take a long time to boot and are a pain in the, well, let's say they're a pain to manage. So we use QMU on our desktops to allow us to get a better privilege without having to actually do anything that would crash our own machine. We can use it to control the process of features that our emulation can see so that we can say, okay, our very much latest laptop can now look like an Intel Atom. And then we can use that to run and debug our kernel entry because we can also stop it, use GDB. I also found that a lot of even the embedded x86 boards are not very helpful when it comes to debug. Um, yeah, so allowing Q so using the QMU here made the development cycle very much faster. We could automate our testing and see how our changes worked and do some, do various testing there. So next thing, this is probably much more interesting to people um, producing systems. 
we can use it to integrate into your CI pipeline. So testing your real software without actually having a piece of hardware or allowing it to spin up multiple different hardware to test. We've done this on a number of projects ourselves, but this is one of the first points where there are good real world examples. So Sue say use QMU with OpenQA. They can test each release they produce out of their CI pipeline without putting it onto a real machine. <coughs> they can do completely boot flow from as if you were installing it from a USB or CD device um, from that boot to actually getting to a desktop and even doing things like, can we launch a media player? Because that would be a good test that we actually didn't install what we thought we did. Um, hopefully, there's the URL there you can go and look and it will show you thing. So we've done very much simple, uh, similar with QMU, with both OpenQA and also Lava for doing various kernel CI type stuff and the project work. So going on to more real world examples of this. So a lot of our work involves real hardware. Customers come along saying, we have this all this software, we want to integrate it or we're having problems. They ship us a massive thing that you, you put on your desk, and you go, that's very nice, um, but I now don't have a desk to work on. Um, and also you're going, well, we're hand testing this. How do you test this? And the, the, the reply was, well, we have 20 people sat in a room somewhere running through scripts. So they can only generally test a release or two a day. So that's not like you commit a branch and have it tested. So that's not great. So as part of improving the testing, we introduced a virtualized version of these rigs. It allows us to do not quite, but almost commit level testing. It's easier to scale. Um, when you ask a client, can I have another one of these very big things that fits on a desk? They go, yes, you can have one of those in another two months. And then you just hope that they can build them within those two months and say it doesn't get lost in Holland. Because who doesn't love couriers? Um, couriers get very upset when you say that they, you just lost $20,000 worth of stuff and they suddenly find it. Anyway. Part of we found the of doing these automated tests improves the testing. And we'll talk about a bit about that in this slide and the next. So we we have these automated test systems that have virtual instances. So we can now use OpenQA and to replace the testing that manually was happening. The client goes, that was great. We can now do commit to testing before we even merge this to our system. Um, one of the big things that we found, it does remove human error from this. Whilst humans are very good generally at doing things, they're not always correct. So part of this also means you also have logged output from your testing so that you know what happened for each test run so unfortunately, and we'll, 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 there are some downsides, you cannot get 100% accurate, 100% testing for various reasons, and we'll talk about that next. But you can do things like insert a USB stick into the system and with a known set of media on it and check what happens. Now, we, one of the issues we found with human testing is that, say, if your humans are mostly European, they won't generally know a lot of the non-European script. If something slightly changes in, say, your sort order and your media, they may not notice. It looks like Japanese to them. It may not now be in the right sort order, 
But that was sort of one of the things that we have picked up as part of this testing. Somebody changed the code that sorted their media, not picked up. You can also feed in simulated hardware events. So for example, if your, you, your rig happens to be a car, you can feed in, say, a known set of test drive information and just check that all the dash happens. Or you can look for very simple issues where maybe you want a warning light to happen. So from experience, we have improvements in the way you can scale the testing up. However, as I say, we cannot test everything. So you may not get a completely accurate hardware emulation, but you're usually getting something that's close enough to work. Um, as I said, there may not be 100% accurate device emulation. Um, I mean, QMU cannot give you a case where, say, you plug a phone in, although you can do some emulation of that. Well, probably not going to be perfect. Um, certainly, a complete car is probably out of the range of what you're able to do for your environment. You There's a trade-off between effort of emulation and what you want to do. So we, we're saying that you can get close to what you need for real life, but you don't have to get it perfect. A lot of the time, say, if you're just doing this testing, you can control your startup environment was one of the big things we found. If something goes wrong, it's much easier to pick out what happens in your emulated environment than try and work out why you've just bricked free rigs that you have to then plug into a Windows laptop to reflash because somebody managed to break their system, these startup scripts. So again, performance is not going to be 100% the same as a real system. You may not have exactly the acceleration hardware, but you know, Things like graphics, you can get fairly good results with Vertio GPU and GL pass-through. They're efficient and they're well supported by pretty much all the software you'd expect to run even on an embedded system. So the hardware support is generally good, but CPU can be a bit slow. Again, it's more about giving a quicker feedback for developer experience without having to give the developer a complete system. So I'll go quickly through one of a weird edge case that we found. Sometimes multi-monitor systems don't work at boot, which is very annoying if you're saying working on a system that has three or four different monitors on it and they all need to start up at once. Um, there were some issues around how QMU deals with its graphics state the documentation in this case was not exactly helpful. And the source is even worse, it's confusing. It uses terms like monitor, display, head very interchangeably. So actually we just ban we just really quickly hacked a fix together, which was to start our virtual machine paused and then just issue the DBUS controls to connect the monitors as we needed. This is something we would like to fix later, but we really can't see charging the client for it because we're working on client time. And whilst the client likes what we've been doing with this, is going, that's great because we now have a much better CI pipeline. And we don't have to pay a pe uh, like for another 20 people in Germany or something like that because, you know, paying people to do stuff and then still not getting as good flow. So in all in all, that, that sort of CI process has shown to be a generally a win. There are much more good results out of it than bad. 
So next project that I've, I, this is much more a personal project for, not, this is a project I have been working on. So client comes to say, we're going to make this new hardware. Um, can we have some Linux for it, please? And we're going, that's great. We can provide you some Linux. Um, when you'd like to start, well, start as soon as possible. OK, well, can we have some hardware then? Um, no, because the hardware we're making next year. So, OK, now how do we test this software? Well, uh, there is a single FPGA system somewhere that we don't know about buried in some secret lab that we get access to, which is great. But there's four developers and one FPGA. So we've been looking at this and went, well, actually, the best way of getting started would be to use QMU. Now, our first problem that we've got is that not all the silicon IP may be in QMU yet. Either it's new or somebody hasn't used it. QMU does not generally support every single variety of hardware out there. It tries to go more for a virtual machine and then there are some actual machine emulations. But the device models are smaller than, say, a Linux system where there would be a lot more devices being available. So our first problem was what do we do? Do we add some new, new, add new device models? Do we replace something? Do we ignore it? So as in replace, we could say, OK, we'll not use that piece. We'll use this. It's similar enough. Um, also hope that the IP that we've got includes the CPU core, because that would be even worse, trying to update the CPU cores. So as part of this project, uh, we decided to start adding our own machine model. So that describes how the entire system fits together. And we run this up, and we have to start debugging, because now we have not only the, the real FPGA silicon to try and debug, but we also have QMU to try and debug, because as we're adding things, we might find issues. So advantage, um, we've got a lot less access problem. Uh, we have our four developers doing stuff without having to worry who's got the login on this very expensive FPGA. And by very expensive, I believe it costs more than an um, average family car per board. Um, Another advantage is the client goes, that was a good idea. We should probably release this at some point. Um, disadvantages on this are, again, accuracy. We're not going to get a completely 100% accurate model. Um, it's more work. Um, it's thankful that we had some delays in the project where we could work on this, otherwise we'd probably be having to bill the client more money. And generally, unless they're very understanding, they don't want to pay you more money because, well, budget. Um, one of the interesting problems we came across is actually upstreaming. So from both a QMU developer point and a client point, QMU would not, doesn't want to accept driver models for machines that don't exist, but the client doesn't want to tell people this machine exists until they've got some next year. So we can't say, here's your machine. Oh, and by the way, we, we wrote five new driver models for this. Um, it also turns out that the client forgot to take um, to talk to their legal people and go, we're commissioning these people to do Linux. Um, all that documentation we gave them, shouldn't we have cleared this for release before, say, now? <sighs> it's like, hopefully that's now all sorted out.
So yeah, the experience, working both ends of the emulation from making your device and then to using your device may not always be great, especially in a small team. Mistakes can get duplicated. You may read a data sheet one way. You may not have a correct data sheet. Um, there's a there's saying, there's a lies, damn lies, and data sheets. Uh, no, that's something else, but you know, it might be statistics. Um, your QMU core emulation may not cover exactly all the use cases. Um, either it hasn't been released yet because maybe it's something that's not available or that the client hasn't got around to doing that part of the work either and then employs somebody else to do it. So in our case, the actual core features were not a problem, so we just pick the closest available. Um, for instance, this was another interesting issue we found early on in the boot system. Risk five atomic memory operations. So the operations you do to say, make sure a core is synchronized with everybody else, do not work on all memory types, which is annoying when you go to your real system and find out that the boot block you're using is not covered by the atomic memory operations. And what the first thing you boot does is an atomic memory operation. You go, well, that why that crashes. It works under QMU because QMU makes no check. As long as it's memory, atomic memory operations will work there. Um, again, we're not going to be timing accurate. So things like, say, SPI bus timings, not going to matter. If you miss a cycle, it may not care. Um, internal hardware states, maybe they're not modeled either, but So, okay, doing well for time. So, thank you. Some of the conclusions. So, as I say, QMU may not be totally accurate. Your vendor may provide something that is more accurate, but it isn't going to be open source. Even though it may not be totally accurate, it's probably going to be close enough in most cases, we found that it gets enough coverage to say we'll catch about 80% of the mistakes without having to involve a real human. Again, it's also it's much easier to scale something like QMU. I, mean, I believe in a couple of other presentations, they've also shown systems like using AWS instances. But again, this is going to probably be cheaper than making a lot of your own hardware, especially at the moment when things are not easy to get. The scriptability is also very good. It allows you to inject errors, control the system, get state out of it. So thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, I've just realized that I have not uploaded this slide set to the talk, to the conference set. However, it is pretty much the same as the one I gave at OSS Dublin. I hope this gives people some thought for how QMU could be used to improve their workflow or used to emulate other systems. Again, QMU is a big enough project that you could get yourself lost in there very easily. Um, I think we've got a little time for questions. I don't know. I haven't, uh, so there was, 
is there any fundamental difference to say Linode? I wouldn't. I, unfortunately, I don't know. I don't. No, it's not the some some. Sorry. Linode is not something I've used. So, um, again, I'm not saying QMU is the absolute best. It's just we found it pretty useful for what we've done. So, I think that's pretty much. Cool. Well, thank you for coming. I hope that that was something interesting or useful. And hopefully that you can find something to take your interest and carry on. So it's been lovely being here. <laughs>